Internet nitpicking has done more damage to media as a whole than it has helped it. I disagree with that statement, but let's hear him out. I could and probably should spend this entire video just saying I'm sorry again and again and again and again, but I think that wouldn't make for a very interesting video. For those of you who don't know, he is likely talking about his review for Turning Red. If that's the case, I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, you're just mad because you actually were one of the people that defended him on that video. And to that, I respond with, no, not entirely. I mean, yes, I am a bit bumped. I'll get into more of it later. So let me be clear what I mean first of all. There's a difference between criticizing something and nitpicking something. I disagree, but I guess that depends on our definition of nitpick, since nitpick seems to be one of those words that doesn't have a clear-cut definition. Here's my definition of nitpick. A nitpick is an issue with a form of art that is relatively small, but still an objective issue nevertheless. Now, it's likely that his definition of nitpick is somewhat different, Though, he does say some things in this video that makes me question otherwise. But basically, no, I do not think there is a difference between a nitpick and a criticism, since I consider a nitpick to be a type of criticism. And, keep and by the way, I have nothing against Mr. Enter himself. This is not out of spite. In fact, this video I'm responding to is one of ten videos he made called Unpopular Opinions. And strangely enough, this was the only opinion that I felt was truly indeed unpopular. I'm just responding to this video because I feel like it's a little bit necessary, that's all. And keep in mind, I am admitting to doing both of these. One of my more recent reviews, Brawl in the Family, Lincoln isn't aware of the protocols that goes on his own house, that he's lived in his entire life. He doesn't know about this sister fight protocol, and that ruins the experience of the episode. It's frustrating and it's forced. Yes, I agree, wholeheartedly. Well. Assuming that the review of that episode was accurate, as I have not actually seen that episode, but I did see that review of yours. But, if what you said is true, then yes, I wholeheartedly agree with that criticism. Something else that you could complain about, Lincoln has ten sisters. This is incredibly illogical, and it is also something that is forced. Uh, have you heard of that, uh, that, that one family with the evil parents and the, the shit ton of kids? But let's see where he's going with this. But that is what the show is about. If you didn't have that happen, you'd have no show. There's this concept that we used to have called suspension of disbelief. Most fiction of some kind has a concept that probably couldn't happen in reality. I agree so far. A boy gets a letter to a magical school. A man's entire life was a TV show. A news reporter repeats the same day over and over again. All concepts are entirely unbelievable. They don't happen in reality. And there are a thousand different illogical absurdities that you could point out in each and every one of these things. But that is the point of fiction. Whoa, 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 whoa. okay, okay. Yes, there are plenty of stories that require suspension of disbelief, but even the suspension of disbelief does have a limit to it. Some stories that have a concept that is illogical can still be broken by other illogical things. And I will explain how further in the video. Like, let's take a look at Harry Potter and the internet's treatment of the concept. Well, let me explain more about the internet's treatment of Harry Potter before we dig right into it. You see, apparently Harry Potter has been receiving some backlash, and not just because of J.K. Rowling herself. Apparently, the Harry Potter series has had some very huge gaping plot holes that many have been picking up recently. I even have a link in the description of one video that points out some major ones in the Goblet of Fire. How many times have you heard, what's the mortality rate at Hogwarts? Now, I don't want you to take what I say about Harry Potter as factual, as it has been a long time since I've seen the films, and I only read three of the books a long time ago. But yeah, the mortality rate question, I am willing to wave off as a silly question, considering the fact that the only instances I can recall of actual mortality rates or even possibility of mortality rates at Hogwarts is in Chamber of Sequence with the snake, the Goblet of Fires with the tournaments, and the Deathly Howls with the final battle with Voldemort. I can imagine that the mortality rates at Hogwarts is relatively low. What about satellites? Good question. Though I can imagine that they probably would have some spells that could affect how satellites see the world. Though it probably would be a bit interesting for Harry Potter to delve into deeper of how they hide magic users from the muggle world. 
Why aren't they making these students take their detention in the super deadly forbidden forest? Good question. How do the kids learn reading and math if their only schooling is magic? Now, I don't remember if the story explicitly says Hogwarts is exclusively about magic. Though if it is, then yeah, that could be a plot hole. Though I myself am pretty sure it is implied that they do have regular classes, and they just don't really talk about them within the stories. That's one of the tricky issues about storytelling. There are some things that should be explicitly said, and other things that could just be implied. And it's difficult to tell which it's which. <laughs> Get it? Wh you know, as a kid, I didn't care about any of this stuff. Why? Because the story is about a kid learning to do magic at a magic school, and that's fun and cool. I can relate to that. I didn't care about why the ancient Transformers built a sun-killing machine despite them not wanting to in Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. The story is about giant robots, and it's fun and cool. And before many of you ask, yes, I unironically was a huge fan of the Michael Bay films as a kid. But because it's not a real thing that really, really happens, y you do need to fudge things up a bit. Alright, here's my ultimate problem with this video. Yes. There are stories that do need to fudge logistics up a bit. It needs to create its own form of logic. The issue is when a story is not consistent with its own form of logic. Let's say, for example, the Indiana Jones films. The form of logic that the story initially fudged up is that many of the artifacts the archaeologist finds are supernatural. That doesn't mean the audience should then expect the archaeologist himself to survive a nuclear bomb without any of those artifacts. The haunted living castle is logically impossible, and even a bad idea in the real world. Uh, that depends on the type of haunted castle. I imagine Hogwarts itself has been tamed by many of the professors, with the exception of the Chamber of Secrets, which, come to think of it, why does Hogwarts even have the Chamber of Secrets in the first place? But not in the books world. Buckle up, folks. This one's gonna be a doozy. This film takes place less than a year after the September 11th terrorist attacks. I bring this up because it radically altered the culture of the time, in ways that make this movie feel exceptionally ignorant of the time. That was a stupid point, I'm not gonna defend it, and I can't say sorry enough for this kind of stuff that I've been doing throughout my entire career. I'm surprised it took this long for it to catch up to me. Ah, uh, yes. The infamous Turning Red 9-11 video. Yep, for those of you who don't know, this is the man responsible for it. And interestingly, if you've watched my channel beforehand, you know I am one of the very few people that actually defended this video. And like I said, I'm not mad about this video making my defense video look worthless. In fact, I myself have changed a couple stances on this situation since this video. And that's because I originally made the defense video with the assumption that people were uh, non-smart enough to assume that he literally meant the film should have talked about 9-11 explicitly, when I was saying that the review was simply saying that 2002 was strangely upbeat within the film in comparison to the real world. I somewhat have regretted making that defense video because, as I would discover with some of the comments of that video, some of the constructive comments I appreciate having, it turns out people were fully aware that that's not what Mr. Enter meant. The actual issue people took with the video was the implication that the 2000s was a depressing decade because of 9-11. People were upset that that's what the Turning Red video claimed. And I agreed with that Turning Red video because that's why I believed. I believe that the 2000s were a depressing, angsty year, especially in 2006. But it seems that apparently a lot of people actually moved on from the shakiness of 9-11. And those that haven't are apparently insane. It's funny because it honestly feels like that 9-11 has damaged the 2020s and 2010s more than it has the 2000s. That's part of the reason why I, and as well as I assume Mr. Enter, have believed that the 2000s was a grungy decade. Now back to the actual video. Turning Red has a world where a girl turns into a giant panda. And it can function just fine in a world of 9-11, it just doesn't need to be explicitly stated. The movie's got other problems. Like, like real problems. He's referring to the main character's Tiger Mom, if you don't know. Now, to be frank, I don't think she would actually consider 
to be a real problem? That's more debatable. Though I am willing to give benefit of the doubt that yes, Turning Red does have real problems. But when you elevate a statement like that to one of those quote-unquote real problems, people listen and media overall gets worse because of this. That is true. There are people that can't tell the difference between accurate criticisms and criticisms that are not necessary for a story. And that is because people usually ask, is this realistic? When they should be asking, is this realistic within the established world of the story? Beauty and the Beast, for instance. There's one thing which people like to call a plot hole. That the prince was cursed for being rude when he was like 10 years old. I mean, even in a world of magic, that does seem needlessly cruel. Though I do agree that that is not an official plot hole. As far as I remember, it's been a while since I've watched Beauty and the Beast. The fairy that cursed the prince could be a cruel person. However, if the story establishes the fairy or angel or whatever that cursed the prince was supposed to be one of the most pleasant people in the universe, one of the most divine, righteous beings in that universe, then yes, her cursing a 10-year-old would indeed be a plot hole. It's called character inconsistency, and it is a storytelling element that should be avoided at all cost. And so they fixed that. They changed the rule in the remake. And in making the remake, they made everything else about the film worse. I haven't seen the remake, but I'll take your word that it is hot garbage. However, it could be that they could have easily fixed the prince's age issue and not make everything else worse. Because I don't think changing the age of the prince when he was cursed is what made everything else about the film worse. For all we know, they could have kept the prince's age to be the same, and everything else about the remake could still be equally as garbage because of incompetence. Oh, Belle has Stockholm Syndrome. No, she doesn't, and it's disrespectful to assume that about what she goes through. I have no comment about that statement other than the fact that it was so clearly obvious that the disrespectful for what she goes through comment was clearly put in after post-recording. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just pointing it out because I like to annoy people sometimes. Because that's me, Spizzard, the delinquent space lizard. We're going to change up her personality and make her super independent so the story doesn't make sense anymore. There are flaws with a movie, a book, whatever, that can break a good entertaining time. Yes, because they're inconsistent with the story's established rule. But there are also these things called acceptable breaks from reality. Yes, because they are established early on and remain consistent throughout the story. It seems so much this day and age that people need to turn magic into math so they can make sure that all of the numbers add up. When it's magic. When the point of magic is so that the numbers don't have to add up. That depends on the type of magic within the story, but yes, oftentimes magic should be math and the numbers should add up within the established world. You see, magic is very hard to write in stories because they can so easily break the universe it establishes. And this doesn't just go to magic either, this can also be applied to science as well. Take the Star Wars franchise, for example. Why does nobody give a shit about sound in space when everybody gives a shit about the infamous Holdo maneuver? Simple because the original film establishes that yes, there are space battles and they still need to worry about oxygen, but they can hear sound in space and it doesn't fuck up anything established within the story so far. The Holdo maneuver in The Last Jedi fucks everything up because it is a move that could be easily used to win any space battle, including the Death Star's battle. Speaking of which, a story is like a magic trick, especially a fictional story. I feel like that is an arbitrary comparison, but go on. Magic isn't real, but the idea of the show is to make an illusion happen. When the trick isn't good or entertaining, that can be why we see the magician pulling a card out of their sleeve. But what are the factors that make the magic trick good or entertaining? Well, entertaining is more subjective, but there are objective qualities in being good. The problem isn't that they pulled a card out of their sleeve. The problem is that that's where we were looking in the first place. No. The problem is that's where the that's where the trick was visible to the audience. The problem is the magician didn't do a good enough job hiding it from us. But even so, this is one of the fewer forms of magic that is mathless. In contrast to, say, the magic from Avatar The Last Airbender. 
Firebenders bend fire. Airbenders bend air. Waterbenders bend water. Earthbenders bend earth. Do we expect any of them to suddenly shoot lasers out of their eyes? Of course not, because there is math to the magic in Avatar The Last Airbender. And if they did start shooting laser eyes, then the issue wouldn't be we were looking at the sleeve. The issue would be the sleeve was exposed in the first place. The man says to the mirror, like, I'm not gonna lie. I've been on both sides of this one. I've written a lot of fantastical things, not just the big obvious one, that have literally been questioned to death. And some of the questions may be reasonable and some of them may not. And I have questioned a lot of other things to death as well. And some of the questions may be reasonable and some of them may not. How long is the moon of Celestia? How do the ponies get such fitting names, Celestia? How do all the ponies not freeze to death in the endless night, Celestia? I have no idea what the fuck he's talking about because he's talking about My Little Pony, which I haven't seen, so I'm not gonna try to respond to that. And as a result for abandoning suspension disbelief, we now have media that keeps trying to give an explanation to magic, and making magic logical is stupid. I strongly strongly disagree with that statement. The hypothetical issue that I think you have a problem with is trying to make magic quote-unquote realistic, which would be somewhat stupid in a way depending on the type of magic. However, even the most fictitious of things can still be logical. There is fiction that can be logical. Logic can be fictional in a certain sense. Answering questions about a fantasy world can lead to interesting places. True. But I firmly believe that a bad answer to the magic, or whatever makes your story different from reality, is infinitely worse than not ever giving an answer. Yes, I agree with that. But the issue then wouldn't be the fact that people, the audience, asked the questions in the first place. It w the issue would be the writer wrote a bad answer in the first place. And the answer being bad would likely be due to inconsistent magical rules. I believe that when we nitpick in such a way, at best we're ignored, and then franchises go on to make a mess. Call me Vosh, because Mr. Enter lost me a little bit. I guess Mr. Enter's saying that it's bad that nitpicks are 100% ignored, but then he'll follow it up by saying that... It'll be bad that they're also 100% taken seriously. That's my guess, anyway. You know, like when wizards shat on the floor and then teleported their shit away before they head into our plumbing, despite the climax of one of the books taking place in a secret chamber in a bathroom that existed when the castle was built? Yes, that is an actual issue. The reason why it is an actual issue is because you have pointed out of how world building with that tweet is quite contradictory to the actual story. In even worse scenarios, media is made to preempt these nitpicks instead of, I don't know, telling a story. That would be an issue, however, that doesn't mean that you can't tell a story without preempting nitpicks. Ten years we've been rusting, needing so much more than dusting. Too long we've been rusting, needing so much more than dusting. If a one-off line in a movie about a magical curse broken by true love ruins it, maybe this isn't the genre for you. I'd recommend The Dictionary, or the nutritional facts on the back of a bag of potato chips. Thiamine mononitrate? What a plot twist! I would be very careful with that mentality if I were you. Too many times have I seen actual criticisms deflected by people being compared to the super nerdy dictionary wannabe geeky guys. Cinema Sin style commentary, what I like to call ding criticism, has done such a damage to basically every industry it's touched. That is true, but not for the reason you may think. Ding style criticism has indeed done damage to the industry, but not because of nitpicks. Quite the opposite, in fact. Ding criticism, especially CinemaSins, have not only made points against films that are more opinionated than actual facts, but they have falsely criticized films for issues that do not exist. I don't want to dig through to show some examples myself, so instead I am going to recommend a very factual video about this situation. Evan Monroe's video on both CinemaSins and Cinema Wins. It is a very good video and I feel like his channel is overall underappreciated. His video will give into more context to what I'm typing about, but basically, rarely do Ding style videos point out actual nitpicks. Instead, they would just make random, strange, and oftentimes false criticisms 
of said form of art. And that is how they've done damage to the industry, by making people struggle to tell the difference between actual and faulty criticism. It is not because of nitpicking. Now this isn't me saying that all criticism is bad, god forbid. In Frozen, for instance, Hans is a poorly written character, he's inconsistent, and it's something that can't really be shrugged off. And it's bad writing any way that you slice it. It's been a while since I watched Frozen, but um, from memory, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I guess him smiling at Anna when he was in the water with the boat above him earlier doesn't make sense in the long run, but I... I think Hans is more debatable, if I'm being honest. The troll's plan and the parents going along with it makes them all seem very stupid, which damages their characters. Well, what if they were meant to be stupid? Does that still damage their characters? These are problems with the movie that probably should have been fixed in the writing room. And if they were fixed, it would make a more structurally sound, better film overall. I'm saying so little about this moment right here because I just can't tell if these issues in Frozen are objective issues or not. Because here's the thing, there is such thing as an accurate nitpick, but that doesn't mean that we all know which nitpick is accurate and which nitpick is not. Because there is objective quality in art, but we as a society, even the most advanced film critics, do indeed still struggle to figure out what makes an objective problem in art. So yes, why well, I am still on my stance that nitpicks aren't bad. They are risky. I will agree with that. Nitpicks are risky. I can't promise that I'm never going to fall into this again. Like, we all have moments and off days. True. And sometimes it is fun to joke about this kind of stuff. Yes, we do. And sometimes we like to jokingly put the fantastical elements of a story against the realism of the real world. However, there are cases where just because we joke about issues doesn't mean that the issues are non-existent. But I really have been trying to separate valid criticism from ding criticism. And I am very glad that you are. However, I do legitimately think you still need to work out a couple of kinks in how you see nitpicks. I'm hoping this video would help, because like I said, I'm not making this video out of spite. I legitimately do hope that this video will help you figure out the difference between valid criticism and ding criticism. This film takes place less than a year after the September 11th terrorist attacks. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll get the Cat of Nine Tails if it'll help. Uh, no, what you need to do is re-review Steven Universe. I'm sure people are genuinely curious into knowing whether that show is still one of your favorites after the fact that it has gone to shit. And that seems to be the end of this video. Now, I'm not sure if it's disrespectful or not to not show his Patreons, so I'm just going to leave it up, just in case. supposed to read all that. You're welcome.